Hi everybody, Bob Mesocomer here. We finally made it. It is Monday, it is five o'clock, and you're on air with us at Five at Five Live. Listen, we're gonna have a little bit of fun tonight. We've got five guests lined up. We've got questions coming in. Hopefully we can learn a little bit. Hopefully they can teach us a little bit. That's what it's all about. You know, that being said, the perimeter of this shot, as you look around the top of this shot and the sides of this shot, these are the people who make it all work for us. These are the people who are very, very uh, interested in making sure that life for them gets better, especially in this uh, coronavirus environment. So if you're thinking about purchasing uh, rods, reels, anything of that nature, uh, just remember one of the people that help us out. When musky fishing gets great, the hottest thing you can have in your boat are Jim Grant rods. Reach out and talk to the big dog himself, Jim Grant. You can call Jim at 847-577-0848. Another company we want to say hi to at this year's show is Grim Reaper, folks. Grim Reaper is here with us right now, and they're going to be working with us for the rest of the season. So welcome Grim Reaper and Doing Grim our Reaper. Thing. There's one question that always comes to mind when when you're doing something like this. And that is, why are we here? Well, we're here to share. We're here to share in the questions. We're here to share in the knowledge. And hopefully everybody will come away with a, a better understanding of what's going on in the real world. We're only going to be taking five minutes for each call. So let's keep it pretty tight. On the line with us right now is Charlie. Charlie, you there? All right, let me hear you, Charlie. We're going to get you on. Make sure you're all set up. Go. All right. All righty. We got you, Charlie. Where are you from, Charlie? Chicago, Illinois. Chicago, Illinois. And you have a question for us, I assume. Yes, I do. And what would that question be? All right, question I got. Uh huh. This is by through guides and through you know, uh, blogs and internet, social media, books, everything that I've always read. Musky fishing, if you're looking for spots to fish, always you want, always want to try to stay in 8 to 12 feet of water with weed growth. Usually cabbage is usually my preferred. And find open pockets of weeds and cast through those, and that's where the musky are question I got is you know, I my lifetime I've caught 47 fish oh nice well that's over 40 years so it's not so good <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't have the 100 plus 50s like you got oh, you'll but, get them uh, I'm working at it I'm working at it you'll get them um, question I got is, is you know 36 of those fish that I've caught have been in deep water uh huh either through trolling or through casting over deep water using generally uh, crankbaits, jake baits, uh, some suix, stuff like that, over the deeper water, and a higher percentage of my catches have been off of deeper water. Now, while I'm in the, you know, as I'm in the shallower water, fishing the weed beds and everything else, I do get follows, and I do get the occasional strike, but for the most part, all of my success has been over deep water. Why is that scenario prominent? Or is it something, is it the body of water that I'm on? Or the bodies of water I'm on? Well, I, there's... You know, I fish uh, Lake Vermilion, Lake St. Clair, uh, Lake of the Woods. And for the most part, everything that I, the higher percentage of success that I have is over deeper water. 
Well, it sort of depends on a number of different things. I myself like to campaign shallow water fish, and here's why I campaign shallow water fish typically. It's mm -hmm. because those fish are in a warmer condition. They're more apt to be a participant in the game. In other words, their need to feed is ramped up, and that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a fish that I can catch. And you're going to hear this more and more and more as this program goes on because mm -hmm. it, finding fish is one thing. Finding a fish that will eat is another. Um, exactly. When you say you fish Lake of the Woods, what part of Lake of the Woods do you fish? Uh, up near Black Island, up in the north. Uh, west corner Canadian side northwest corner so are you getting up into Monument Bay then and areas yep, like that yep, yep exactly yes well <laughs> there certainly are a lot of shallow water areas up there to fish um, a lot of rock <laughs> that's primarily what Lake of the Woods or the shield is and it's right pretty much the result of the Rusky Cray being in there uh, right. which changes it but let's look at the let's look at the fishing that you're doing when you say you see the follows and uh, you're seeing some fish respond a little bit in terms of they're noticeable to you, but you're not catching them. Am I hearing that right? No, that is correct. Um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll get the follows and uh -huh. you know, I'll figure it, figure it till, um, till I can't see them anymore. And it's usually a good three to four minutes that I'll figure eight it. But are, are we, go ahead, know, I'm sorry. Not, I, they're not buttoning on. Are we talking midday or are you finding are you really looking at the more peak times are you looking at midday or most of the time where i'm out uh midday i'll tend to just start fishing for walleye but uh usually early morning and uh late afternoon early evening is when i'll start to go back to, to fishing for muskie uh-huh well and my what... le, more than lately it's been like uh it's been lake st Clair has been my predominant uh, lake of the woods i haven't been to and that's been two years now but i've been hitting lake st Clair much more often it's a lot closer to the house well in one of my previous seminars over the past i've i've tried to get involved in this subject matter in depth and there are things that you really need to look at reefs sunken islands aprons right. weed beds saddles all of those lend themselves, if you will, to the more shallow water environment, uh, mm -hmm. things that are more susceptible to the fish being aggressive. Um, when you're fishing these waters, how tight are you fishing the areas themselves? Are you really getting up there and encroaching on it, or are you staying out and letting the cast do the job? I'll tend to let the cast do the work. I mean, I'll try to get in probably within 20 yards of the break line of the, of the weed beds. Okay. And either either cast diagonally or right into the right into the weeds. All uh, right. For the most part, I try to cast alongside it. Uh, hope for an ambush. Okay, you're the very first guest ever on five uh, at five live. So here's what I want to try to. <laughs> so here's what I want to try to do. Let's paint a scenario that might make more sense rather than trying to banter the entire subject matter. If I, myself, personally got up in the morning and I had, let's say I had cooler nights. Let's say my nights weren't exactly where I wanted them to be in terms of, of water temp. Then my subject matter in, you know, in terms of structure that I'm fishing is probably going to be on the lee side of the lake. The lake that's getting the least impact of that cool water conditions. Okay. All of those, all of those cool water uh, areas that stack up like that will retard those early morning fish. And if you're going after them in the morning, like most of us are, yep, that's one of the subjects that you want to be looking at. So if you've got a warm wind, then go to the windy side. Get on that windy side where it's stacked up a little bit and take advantage of that warming trend. As the day progresses, you're going to move around the lake a little bit. Say, I'm getting the cue from inside the studio that we have had five minutes. And uh, while that's being said, man, five minutes just disappears. And we're going to do things in five by five. So, Charlie, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to invite you back on another show going down the road. I'm going to Great. get the maps out. And we're going to take a look at the water you're fishing. We're going to break down those situations a little bit closer and see if we can't get you on the fish that you're looking for they're there and 
we'll teach you and others how to catch them. So I want to thank you for coming on the show. I know five minutes disappeared fast. So with that being said, Charlie, please let us talk to you again. Uh, get a hold of us and let's get you on a further show. Sound good? Absolutely does. Yes, sir. It's our pleasure, young man. We'll be talking to you in the future. All right. Thank you much. All righty, folks. That's Charlie. He's coming to us from Chicago. You know, again, we're going to be doing these things in five-minute segments. And I was told when I started doing the show that to keep it at five minutes is going to be virtually impossible. I want to try. <laughs> I want to try. When you start breaking down the nuances of of the subject matter and uh, how it might apply to your day on the water, there's going to be a lot of variables that we're going to have to look at. And, uh, and look at them, we will. So... That being said, um, I, I just I just honestly believe that as we move forward in this program format, that we're going to find ourselves um, right up against the five minute mark more often than not. So let's see, we've got Zach is coming up. Is that correct? Zach is coming up. Yeah, Zach here. Hi, Zach. How are you doing, young man? Good. How are you doing, Bob? I'm doing just fine. So you have a question for us here at Five at Five Live. I hear it, huh? I do. I was uh, I was curious about uh, when you you first got into your first sponsorship or and how you did that. Wow, uh, <laughs> that's actually interesting. Do you mind if I keep brand names out of it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Here's a little backdrop. Um, I started doing my show, my fishing show, when it was called Thunder on the Water, way back in the very early 80s. And uh, I came out of the bass world. I had a little bit of time with bass fishing under my belt. I uh, had a few wins and had a bit of a reputation growing in the bass world. And what happened to me is I ended up getting a hold of a sponsor that I had talked to in the past not about doing a show, but about tournament sponsorship. And they were pretty excited to talk to me. So I asked them if I could come down and sit with them and discuss the potential of working with a new TV show. And they were absolutely open-armed. Yes, come on down. Let's see if we can make it happen. So that being said, uh, I traveled down and uh, went down, sat down with these folks, and started putting together the format that we wanted. And we're about 45 minutes into this conversation, and a couple of the people in the room exited, and I kind of, what's going on? And next thing you know, the conversation turned uh, from a positive to a negative, and I was told that as much as I love fishing, as much as that was evident, that for me to pursue muskies probably is not going to work. Um, they said if I were interested in doing other species, i.e. bass, for instance, that I would be a better choice for their advertising dollars. And I said, how can that be? And they said, well, not even Al Linder can do muskies. Well, Al Linder is notably one of the best muskie fishermen walking the planet, one of the best fishermen walking the planet. But his true love, his, his interest, if you will, lie in smallmouth and walleye. And that being said, uh, I just I just said, well, I'll tell you what, give me an opportunity. Let me go to work. Let me try to do a musky show. And they said, no, nobody's going to be able to do it. Nobody can go out and challenge these fish. And furthermore, <laughs> if you were able to challenge these fish, you're going to tell people they have to put them back. That is suicide at the rod tip. And I says, look right at them straight to the face. And I said, folks, here. If we don't teach people how to put these precious fish back, and remember, this is in the early 80s. If we don't teach people how to put these precious fish back, we're not going to have a fishery and you won't have a business. Years later, I signed with that company and we had a great relationship. So I'll keep the name of it out. But uh, our first show that we ever did, our first musky show we ever did, I did with Matt Dahl. Matt and I shot on Lake of the Woods and... Uh, First fish in the boat was 50 inches. We had two 50s in the boat during that show, and we've never looked back. Wow. That's awesome. So you're fishing. What kind of fishing do you do? Uh, we do mostly walleye here in the St. Louis. We stick to that. Um, we, we, we we tend to find a muskie here and there, though. Oh, yeah. Sure. Um, yeah, they're there. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I definitely have been watching some of your stuff, and, and uh, would love to try to try to aim for them but uh, i just have yet to to get the experience really so well there 
they're kind of a different critter, if you will. You know, they, they really are. They take a lot of time and a lot of effort, and they take some very specific equipment to do it. So you're on a system. You're on the St. Louis, you said. And yeah. the St. Louis River, you know, being that it comes right out of Duluth, there's a great opportunity for that fishery there. Um, you sure. could go, you could go miles and miles and miles up that system. And every yeah. time you go up that system, you encounter a different portion of it. You can be fishing oxbows, you're going to be fishing sloughs, you're going to be fishing shoreline edges, you could be fishing timber in there. I mean, there's such a variety of structure that. That's a yep. good place to learn, good place to do it. At Topwater, I will tell you this, people who I've known in the past that have fished that for muskies, Big Blades, Big Blades, and one of the companies that I would highly recommend would be Grim, uh, a Grim Ripper with their big Colorado spinner baits, one and a half ounce and two ounce, and okay. just loud Topwater baits. When that water temperature gets warm, it's kind of dark water up there from what I know. Those would be things yep. that, that I would be looking at. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Are you just pounding then close to shore on the like points and stuff like that, or? Yeah. For the for the most part, we are. For the most part, the way I would approach the system is definitely definitely get out there and start learning the shorelines. Look for things that uh, you know give you value and sense that you might have a little rock outcropping coming out or a timber stand or even slide into some oxbows. If the water temperature when you start early is cool, the further you go back into those oxbow areas, the warmer your water is going to be. You're going to have some spawning or post-spawning females up there, and you're going to have a better shot. And, hey, by the way, that's a great place for the walleyes, too. Great place. Yeah. Yeah, it is. We have a lot of fun. All righty. Hey, listen, it's been a riot to have you on the show. Maybe we can get you on a future show right now. I want to wish you all the best of luck up there in the St. Louis River. Minnesota's got a great fishery. They do a good job managing their systems. And, again, I want to thank you for coming on. Maybe we'll get you back, eh? Yeah, thanks, Bob. You have a good, good night and be safe. All right. Because Jim Grant's got some incredible rocks. We're going to be right back with our next guest. Yeah, I had you on a black screen there for a second. There's a lot of bells and whistles on this thing, so as we get used to this, we're going to find ourselves making a lot of mistakes. I'm pretty certain of that. So, you've got some questions. You got some questions about uh, about musky fishing, as I understand it. Fish, fishy. Yeah, I figure you might know a thing or two. Yet, after all these years, you got to pick what's left of your brain. <laughs> Yeah. There's not a lot of brain left. You're calling us from where? Chicago? Chicago town. Yeah. Nice. Nice. So, yeah, so, you know, I get up to Lake of the Woods maybe once a year, maybe every other year, and sometimes I'll take a trip in early July, and uh, and I tell my buddies, like, oh, this is action time. And we get up there, and we'll fish the traditional stuff, weed beds, Days, uh, saddle areas, and uh, you know, neck down areas, uh, weedy points and stuff. And we get a ton of action. So we'll go to spots, and we might have 20 fish up in the morning and 20 fish up in the evening, and catch a few. But they're all like 35 to 42 inches, you know. And we do that, and we'll go try some other areas, and we do the same kind of formula. And, you know, we'll catch a few, you know, we, they'll get real active. And after a couple of days, you know, we catch three and they're all 36, 38, 41 and having lots of fun, seeing lots of fish. And by the third day, I'm like, you know, we're not seeing any big fish. <laughs> and so then what? the strategy, you're saying, no, where are the big fish at? You know? What time of the year, what time of the year are you going? Yeah, so on these kinds of trips that when it's happened a couple of times, you know, it is funny, you know, as much, many fish as we catch, it gets frustrating actually. You know, right a third day, you know, you're catching all the same same fish. But anyway, it'd be like early July, you know. Early so July. The water's just warming up 
you know, it might get up to 72 degrees or so. Yeah, and, and in there lies part of your problem, to be perfectly mm -hmm. candid with you. Sure. If you take a look at Lake of the Woods, um, just any portion of Lake of the Woods, you see an enormous body of water, a huge body of water. I have seen times when that water isn't even 70 degrees at 4th of July. So mm -hmm. that being said, you've got a fish that's really retarded in terms of how often it wants to feed. You, you've got a fishery, you're going up there the second, third week of June. Third week of June is opener. Yeah. So on the opener. Yeah. So for all intents and purposes, you could have females that are lingering out. They're not necessarily, they're not necessarily your candidate, if you will. But but let's look for a second. Let's just let's. I've got right now. I've got a map up of Bishop Bay. Okay, that just happens to be a map I have. It means nothing. But let's just yeah. use Bishop Bay for for a second here. If we were gonna be if we were gonna be anglers and we wanted to start looking for the big fish, the first thing you want to do here. Okay, we're looking for this. Okay. You see it there. And we're looking for this. We're looking for this down in here. All right. Now, why you might ask? Well, because those are typical spawning habitats. Okay. You have to, in order to catch big fish early in the year, it's advantageous to be relatively close to where these big fish spawn. If you're not close to where these big fish spawn, chances are pretty good you're not going to get the migration. Let's use this instance right here. Okay. So we've got a spot where we could have three or four good societies of fish that are meandering in this area right here. As, okay. soon, as, the, as soon as those fish get done with the spawning ritual, they're going to start making their way out. They're going to make their way out to the islands. They're going to make their way out to the saddles. And in some cases, they're going to make their way down to the points that literally run into the reef areas. And we're going to be spot fishing. We're getting out of the pockets. We're not looking to fish mile or more shoreline. We're looking for the one or two fish that's going to chew. We're looking for the big fish. These fish back in here, these are the resident males that were left back in there. They're comfortable. They'll be there most of the summer. Those fish aren't your target. However, right here, this yeah. could very well be a target place. If you had yeah. big females and males that were intermixing right in here, as soon as that water starts to get warm and they make this transition right to here, if they find that to be a little honey spot, they'll park. They'll sit there and they'll sit there for maybe a week, maybe two weeks before the forage and what have you move them along. The thing is, is focus on small isolated areas, focus on bigger baits. And I'm talking some bigger baits to make all this work. Don't be afraid to get out there and, and literally gun and run. Uh, I'm talking about being able to, being able to fish, you know, 20 casts, 30 casts on a spot, and if that doesn't work out for you, then you move on to the next spot. But don't waste a lot of time. Get away from the baby fish and go look for the big fish. Sound good? Right. Perfect. Yeah, I was wondering. You know, we're looking all over the place and said, oh, can they be deeper? But they got to be. They're around the corner. So. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're sometimes they're they're at your doorstep sometimes they're sitting yep. right there with you and it's just a matter of how you're campaigning them a lot of people have a tendency to want to stay with the smaller baits too during that yep. time of the year and i got to be honest with you henry yep. it's probably not the best choice you want to stay with baits that promote big fish how's that sound yep. yeah good so what is what uh so in that time of the year you run into sunny days too so what do you like throwing on sunny days out there Sunny days, I'm throwing my big baits, but I'm throwing them on rocks. Um, the Lake of the Woods, for all intents and purposes, doesn't have a lot of vegetation to speak of, and I'm and I'm really campaigning the rocks. Um, if I get calm conditions, I'm campaigning rock saddles. That's where I find super fish, super big yeah. fish that are active to go. Henry, thanks for being on the show this week. Maybe we'll get you back. How's that sound? Thanks a ton, Bob. All righty, my pleasure, young man. See, see you on the water. <laughs> yeah, we will see you on the water. Coming up with right now, uh, we're coming up with Keith. Keith, you there? We're dialing Keith right now, so give us just a second. We'll get Keith up.
Keith is coming. I hear the tones. We're going to bring Keith on board with us. Keith, you there? Oh, I hear it ringing. Hey, folks, this is live TV. We're not doing anything here that's predetermined, pre-staged or anything. And I'm... Hey, Keith, are you there? Bob, can you hear me? I certainly can. Can you hear us? I can. Dynamite. Hey, listen, you're coming to us from New York. Yes, yes, I am. <laughs> what are, what kind of water are we talking about out there? What's let's let's, let's what, what are your questions? Let's start there. Well, first off, uh, the body of water is the Thousand Islands, St. Lawrence River, or as they call it, the Larry, uh, gin clear. And one of the things you've always talked about is always have a spinner bait in the water. And I'm pretty confident with color selections, you know, clear water, more natural selection, but. My question is geared more to how much do blades matter, blade combinations, and the application of blades on spinner baits. Well, you are 100. The, you are. Go ahead. I'm sorry. And the, does it matter as much in clearer water versus darker water as far as blade selection? As far as the design of the blades themselves? Yeah. Absolutely, it makes a huge difference. Um, when you're talking about blades, uh, first of all, let's go back to your first statement. Your first statement in your question was, you always have a spinner bait in the boat. The spinner bait, folks, is the most versatile musky bait you could put in your box, period. It's the, the most versatile. There's nothing that's going to beat it for versatility. I don't care who makes it. It's just simply not. You can pull a spinner bait down in the bottom and dredge. You can buzz a spinner bait up on top. You can work it through weeds, rocks. You can do anything you want with the variables that we have. For instance, one of the companies that we've mentioned on the show already tonight, Grim Reaper, has a huge variety of spinner baits from uh, you know small, small to two ounces. And so that being said, if you're packing the right ammunition in terms of your spinner bait selection, you're in deadly water. Now, let's go to your question about the blades. That makes a huge difference, a real big difference. In the blade world, you've really got two types of blades to think about. Uh, and I'm talking about speed versus throb. The Indiana blade, the willow blade, those narrower blades have a tendency to have less buoyancy in them. You run them faster. Uh, and they put out a lot less noise. The thumping noise isn't there that you find in the Colorado in the Colorado blades. The big Colorado blades that we like to throw, those are the blades that I pull probably 70% of the time. Most of the time because I'm fishing in the weeds and that thumping that comes off of those Colorado blades permeates that vegetation very nicely. Uh, if, if all I had to do was burn baits back, I think I would probably go fish bass. But there's a huge difference in the baits. If I were looking to probe a little deeper water, uh, but I wanted to move it along, I wanted, let's say I'm, let's say I'm fishing, you're, you're, you're on the St. Lawrence River, it's clear water, right? Yes, sir. So in the clear water situation like that, I might need to make monster long runs, I might, in turns, I might cast. So I'm going to pick the heaviest spinner bait I can pull in that system. I want to get it down in the column, unlike where I throw my big Colorado blades. Those willow leaves will have a tendency to run deeper, and because I'm going with the heavier weight, I can burn them. Not burn them, but I can move them back pretty fast. Clearwater fish have a tendency to use their visual aspects of predation more so than the lateral line. So that being said, a flashy bait, willow leaf, heavy, and then I can make monster long cast and try to burn those fish back to get an active fish. On that same system, you have rocks and you have weeds. So that being said, um, if you pull up into those weeds and rocks, make the conversion back to the one and a half ounce, for instance, and go back to the to the thumping Colorado blades, and don't be afraid to get that thing up on the surface and bulge it, because you could pull something out of a weed bed that, quite frankly, could scare you. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, we, we've got quite a diverse system up on the St. Lawrence, because uh, we've got a combination of rock shoals, drop-offs, weed beds, that lead to a drop off. We've got it all. It, and 99% of the people are trolling up there. So I'm one of the few that actually cast for muskies on that system. So. Well, that is certainly a fact. And it's the expanse of water that does it. People, people tend to 
take the easy way. I say the easy way out. You guys can pull multiple lines there, unlike us here in Minnesota. You can pull multiple lines, and it is a matter of ratio of fish hook up to fish in the boat. Let's face it, it is. So pulling multiple lines, it's a good way to do it. But those of you who cast, those of you who learn how to, like you're saying today, choose the right spinner bait at the right time, pull the weeds, pull the rocks, take advantage of those places that the trollers can't hit, good golly, Miss Molly, you're going to get bit, and you're going to get bit by big. Okay. It's going to happen. So you were, so you were saying that uh, on gin clear water, they are using their eyes more than their lateral lines, so keep the bait moving faster which is interesting because in the past I've slow rolled trying to get the bait as deep as possible, but maybe having a, a little bit faster presentation is going to be what triggers them. Yeah, you want to try to trigger the strike. And remember I said two ounce with willows, not one and a half, two ounce, because that bait's going to run deeper in the column naturally. It's going to stay down there. The willow leaf is not going to have a lot of lift on it. So consequently, it'll get you, you'll run deeper to the boat. It's just going to be a little bit better deal. That being said, hey, Keith, I hope we got your questions answered. And if not, hey, I'll have you on the air again in the future. Uh, we've got your number. If you have another question you want to get back on, just let us know. I'd love to have you on 5 at 5 Live. Thanks for coming on with us on our first show. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. All righty. Thank you. All right. We got our last guest coming up right now. We've got a young lady, it looks like, from... Duluth, Minnesota, that's coming up. So this ought to be interesting. Um, we don't have a lot of gals out there that participate, uh, at least at least in the call-in shows. And uh, I know there's a lot of gals out there that tournament fish and tournament fish with their spouses and significant others. I hear a dial tone. We got a phone going out. Let's see if we can get her on the line. Hello. Hi. We got Madison. Yes, this is. Hey, Madison, how are you doing? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing really well. Welcome to the show. Thank you. So you're an angler lady. Oh, yeah. Gotta love that. <laughs> I guess, yeah. So you have a question for us today? Um, Yeah, I was actually wondering if when you fish musky, do you ever use live bait? <laughs> oh, boy. You read my bio, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually didn't. <laughs> oh, I got to tell you. Oh, let, let me start by saying this. Um, live bait fishing is a, tradi a tradition in many of the musky waters throughout the Midwest, especially the, the sister state to us in Wisconsin. It seems to be what people like to do in the fall. And I'll explain to you why it's more applicable in the fall. Now, to answer your first question, I don't fish live bait. Um, I'm a stand-up caster. I'm a spot-on spot fisherman. I enjoy the challenge of trying to get the fish to respond. But there are times, there are times when live bait can be more successful. Remember, in Minnesota now, you can only use one line, as opposed to Wisconsin, where you can use multiple. Some other states you can multiples too, but here in Minnesota, you got one. Now that said, I have a friend of mine, Matt Horvat. Um, Matt and I go back many, many years, and uh, Matt said to me probably six, eight years in a row, Bob, let's go, let's go sucker fishing. Let's go sucker fishing. I'm like, Matt, I don't do it. I don't do it. He says, why not? I says, well, this is a shallow impression of it, Matt, but it's kind of like, it's kind of like going to the mega mall with a gold card. You know what's going to happen. And he said, <laughs> he said, I don't think that's true. So last year, last year, Matt and I got together and we put suckers down for one afternoon. I didn't go very long at it. We went a full, a full solid afternoon into the evening. And mm -hmm. I, I found out that it isn't that easy. There, and there's a lot to it. There's okay. A, there's a lot to it. Um, the thing to remember with suckers and why they're advantageous in the fall is during summer peak when the water temperatures are up in the mid 70s or higher yeah. uh yeah. but below the 77 78 threshold on the top these fish only rely literally on one sense to become a predator um, in situations where that's the case your spinner baits and topwater baits and things that we throw all the time 
they're really your lure of choice because you got a fish that's aggressive. Take away 10 degrees, and every time you take away 10 degrees, you find out that one more sense is almost necessary to trigger that fish with any with any reliability. So when you're down to just above 30 to 38 degrees, 40 degree water, these fish are relying on sight, sounds, and, and smell and taste. So okay. when when you put that sucker out there, and if you've got let's say three in the boat, and you've got a properly sucker harness rigged sucker out. Two people are casting, and they're bringing fish. They don't even know they're casting. Let's just say they're casting. Doesn't seem to be any evidence, or they see a visual of one, and that fish turns away because you couldn't trip it. Well, that fish will often go over and take a look at that sucker that you gave them, and sometimes that's all it takes to get that fish to respond. Okay. They come up, they taste it, they smell it, they eat it, but you still don't get all of them. And that's one of the fallacies that I had in my mind for decades was, well, once they touch it, you own them. I found out that's not so true. Am I going to become a sucker fisherman? No. Am I going to give more respect to the sucker fishermen who do? You bet. Because of Matt oh. Horvat, I am. Yep. Awesome. You sound you sound pretty awesome too. Uh, where are you headed? Where are you headed for the opener? Any place? Uh, the St. Louis River. Oh, you're going there. It's going to be a crowd on the St. Louis River. Look it out, always, people. It always is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Say, that's a, that's a, you, you speak about muskie fishing there just briefly. That's a spot that you might want to take a, take a few casts for the muskies and uh, see if you can get those fish in the boat there. Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All, all righty. Hey, it's a, our pleasure. We're done with our five minutes here. I hope we covered what you were looking for. And uh, yeah. I want to thank you for coming on the show, and hopefully we can get you back in the near future. Um, oh, definitely. Thank you so much. All righty. My pleasure. Thanks. Have a good season. You too. Thank you. All righty. Folks, as we bail out of here tonight, remember, grant rods, folks. The people who bring us the rods and put them in the boat, put fish in the boat, this is who you do it with. And we do it every day, all day, on Big Grant, Big Dog Rod. You should be doing the same thing. Hey, we talked a little bit tonight about the spinner baits. When you're out there looking for your tackle, remember there's at least one line to look at, and that is Grim Reaper. So get them wet, guys. Catch those fish, and uh, and let's have some fun in the process of doing it. Um, this is Bob Mesa Comer saying thanks. I hope you enjoyed tonight's show. We are probably a little rough out there, probably some switching issues and things of that nature. But remember, uh, get a hold of us at bob.m at fishandstickstv.com and let's get your questions on next week's show. If you give me a little bit of time on them, we got time to work on them. If you want to make them spontaneous like we had tonight, I'm all for it. Uh, let's just see if we can make it happen. God bless everybody. And uh, again, thanks for coming and thanks for tuning in 5 at 5 Live right here.